Good afternoon. And my name is Dan Diaz, and I am Brittany Menard's husband. I was asked to share Brittany's story with you today, but this will not be the version of the story that I've told over the past year to senators and assembly members uh, while providing testimony at judicial hearings in my efforts to help pass that legislation in California. That version of the story contained numbers and statistics and polling data. Today, I will share Brittany's story in the context of our collective humanity, the human side of what she went through. <clears throat> Brittany and I met on April 30th of 2007. It was a Monday night. I still remember the specific portions of our conversation from that evening, the sound of her laughter, hearing it for the first time. The conversation between Brittany and I was effortless. We went on a few more dates, and it didn't take long for us to quickly decide that we were a couple, boyfriend and girlfriend. I find myself looking forward to seeing Brittany every evening after work. We spent most of our free time together. I was at her place where she was at mine. We were falling in love. <clears throat> Brittany and I would take weekend trips to California's wine country. That was easy enough. It was an hour and a half drive uh, from where we lived at the time. Or we'd go to a friend's lake house and spend the weekend on the water. We took a trip to New York, another trip to Chicago. So what happens when two people are falling in love? You find yourself being affectionate and playful. You become supportive of one another's goals and their aspirations. You establish trust. You laugh and you smile a lot. We certainly did. <clears throat> you learn about the other person, and maybe just as importantly, you learn about yourself and how much this new person in your life means to you. Brittany and I were together for three years, and then we were apart, broken up for a full year. Love, it seems, sometimes it takes a detour. It did for us. When we got back together, we were reminded of how truly connected we felt to one another. We shared so much in common, our interests, our goals in life. We talked about wanting a family. Brittany wanted two kids. I thought three or four sounded better, but we agreed that we would <clears throat> figure that out when it came up. We were engaged and then married in 2012. We bought a house and started settling into our lives together. That was the slide I was expecting earlier. This is also when that little mongrel showed up. <clears throat> I include a picture of, of the dog intentionally. Um, it's amazing the love and support that we humans derive from our four-legged companions. Um, so this is Charlie. This was a photo that uh, became rather iconic of Brittany. Um, and so when he first showed up, this is what he looked like next to our dog that we'd already had, which is a beagle. <laughs> Keep your eye on the beagle because she, of course, remains the same size. <laughs> but nine months later, <laughs> so that's our family. 125 pounds. <laughs> a few months after our wedding, Brittany started having headaches <clears throat> that would wake her up in the middle of the night. She'd get sick, be unable to sleep. The headaches seemed to subside for a few months with the uh, prescription, uh, prescription for migraines that a specialist had given her. But by the end of 2013, uh, by the end of that year, the headaches were back. On New Year's Eve, while we were at a trip in wine country that Brittany had planned, I had to take Brittany to the hospital because the pain was getting too intense that day. 
and something just seemed terribly wrong. She was transferred to a hospital closer to our home, and after an MRI, we discovered that Brittany had a brain tumor. That it was very large, and that there was no cure, uh, only certain treatment options. Brittany endured an eight-hour brain surgery simply to debulk, essentially to create enough space in her skull so that the current symptoms would subside. Three to five years of life was the time frame that she was given. Just two months later, the tumor suddenly showed signs that it was growing aggressively, and they then informed Brittany that six months was all the time she had left. <clears throat> so what does one do in the middle of all this chaos, of all this stress? Well, we turn to one another for mutual support, for caring, for tenderness, for understanding. In the middle of the night when you're laying in bed, when we're laying in bed and she can't sleep, we hold one another, never wanting to let go. Brittany was determined to live, and we researched every treatment option that was available. The tumor was still growing, of course, and Brittany's health was deteriorating. There was no cure that could save her life. And unfortunately, the treatment options that were available, chemotherapy and radiation, <clears throat> those might give her two or three months on the back end, but she would start feeling horrible now, or at, immediately at that time. I'm not afraid to die, Brittany told me one day. <clears throat> I'm not afraid of death. Death, death does not have that power over me. This just happens, don't worry, it passes. <laughs> Those words were not lip service coming from Brittany. I knew she truly meant it. She did not fear dying. But, but I am afraid of suffering, she said especially since I will die anyway. I would prefer to die gently, not struggling and in pain. Early on, Brittany had brought up the topic of medical aid in dying. We talked about it, and I absolutely understood where she was coming from and the logic of this program. The fear of being tortured to death if the brain tumor was allowed to run its course. That was the one thing that terrorized Brittany. The reality that she would have to endure pain that could not be alleviated or even controlled with Dilaudid. Dilaudid, by the way, it's four times stronger than morphine, and she was already on pretty hefty doses of Dilaudid. Seizures that become increasingly frequent and severe. Personality changes where one minute the individual seems normal, and the next minute they are agitated, cruel, violent. The probability, the probability that she would go blind as a tumor grows in her brain and starts pressing on different parts. The likelihood that she would lose the ability to write and communicate altogether. It's not uncommon for the brain tumor to cause a stroke. And then depending on what part of the brain is damaged due to lack of oxygen during the stroke, she could lose motor function the ability to stand, walk, and swallow. Partial paralysis is common and complete paralysis a possibility. Brittany said, I will not die that way. Why should I have to? Brittany decided to live her life to the fullest. I took a leave of absence from work. Brittany found a house for us to rent here in Portland, established residency. We found a new medical team we packed up half our house in California into a U-Haul. We drove 600 miles north. Nobody should have to go through that at their end of life, having to leave home like that. Brittany then applied for, qualified for, and was granted the prescription for medical aid in dying. But that wasn't her focus. <clears throat> 
Brittany's passion was being outdoors in nature. So we went to Yellowstone National Park, a spot she had wanted to visit for years. A few weeks later, she was hiking glaciers in Alaska with her friend and her mother. It was during that trip when Brittany was in Alaska that I went to pick up the prescription. When Brittany returned from Alaska, she put the medication in the cupboard and we focused on living life. We focused on love. We went to <clears throat> Olympic National Park in Washington, Hood River in Oregon, and we took a helicopter tour of the Grand Canyon. Up until Brittany received the medication, she could not escape the torture that the brain tumor could exact upon her. But all of a sudden, simply because of simply having the medication, that terror vanished. Brittany had taken control back from the tumor. The tumor could no longer torture her to death. Brittany, had a, Brittany held a trump card that the tumor could not defeat. A quote I found, <clears throat> to conquer fear is the beginning of wisdom. And another one, wisdom is antithetical to fear. In fact, it's what enables a person to overcome fear. Brittany was wise beyond measure for deciding to fight the cancer from organ. Her determination to fear less is an accomplishment that I fully understood the value of upon seeing the change in Brittany's outlook from that point on. She was empowered and in control. And, and when you're facing death, that's huge. I keep in my heart all of the good times we shared together. Everything from the details of our first date to just sitting on the couch next to one another watching a movie, our wedding day, our honeymoon. All of those events play out in my memory and they make me smile. We've all heard it said, don't cry because it's over. Smile because it happened. I choose to smile. By the way, if you've never heard that quote, you need to brush up on your Dr. Seuss. <laughs> I made a promise to Brittany to do what I can to help pass legislation so no one else has to move from their home in order to secure a gentle passing. I continue to work on that effort. <clears throat> Brittany's voice made a huge difference in this conversation on end-of-life options. Governor Jerry Brown's statement in California mentioned Brittany by name as one of the factors that he took into consideration while deliber deliberating signing the law. This year alone, 25 states have introduced or will be introducing legislation. It just goes to show that one voice truly can make a difference. Brittany's, <clears throat> Brittany's voice certainly did. Brittany died gently on November 1st of last year. Within five minutes of taking the medication, she fell asleep very peacefully. Within 30 minutes, her breathing slowed to the point where she passed away. It was truly one of the gentlest passings that one could hope for. The brain tumor would not have allowed for that. Brittany's story is a story of love. It's a story of determination. It's a story of living life. And it's a story of triumph. In the end, Brittany did not die as a victim to cancer. She died in the same manner that she lived her life, with grace, compassion, and love for herself and for her family. On behalf of Brittany, I give my thanks to each and every one of you, to Compassion and Choices. Thank you for being a part of this effort. Thank you for the countless hours of work, for your contributions, and for sharing your compassion with one another. <clears throat>